The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows is an esoteric text believed to have been published in Venice in 1666 by the mysterious and enigmatic author Aristoria Toria. Toria, a noted printer and scholar of the occult, is said to have compiled the book from older arcane manuscripts, some of which were rumored to have been written by the devil himself. The book's intricate woodcut illustrations and cryptic Latin prose have fascinated and confounded scholars for centuries. The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows is meticulously structured into to nine chapters, each representing a gate that the reader must metaphorically pass through to attain ultimate enlightenment and power. Each chapter contains a combination of cryptic text and symbolic woodcut illustrations. Chapter 1, The Gate of Awakening. The first chapter serves as an introduction to the journey ahead. It focuses on the necessity of awakening from the illusions of everyday life perceive the true nature of reality. The text discusses the importance of inner vision and the concept of spiritual awakening, urging the reader to shed preconceived notion and open their mind to the unseen world. Rituals in this chapter are designed to enhance mental clarity and spiritual perception, often involving meditation, fasting and the use of specific herbs to induce altered states of consciousness. In sleep lies truth. You must awaken to the true secret, for it opens the first gate of your soul. Chapter 2, Gate of Reflection. This chapter delves into the practice practice of self-reflection and the examination of one's own soul. It emphasizes the necessity of understanding and confronting one's inner demons. For proceeding further, detailed instructions for creating a mirror of the soul involve a special reflective surface consecrated with incantations and symbols. Through this mirror, practitioner is meant to see their true self, uncovering hidden fears and desires that must be acknowledged and controlled. The mirror of your soul will reveal the hidden truth. Reflect and you will find the way. Chapter 3 the gate of knowledge. Here, the book provides an introduction to the acquisition of forbidden knowledge. This chapter contains ancient alchemical formulas, descriptions of arcane symbols, and the names of spirits that govern the hidden realms of the earth. Also includes incantations and rituals for invoking these spirits and gaining their favor. The emphasis is on the intellectual and scholarly aspects of the occult, encouraging the reader to study and memorize various mystical texts and diagrams. Knowledge is power. The true names of demons, you shall rule. Chapter 4. Gate of Conjunction. This chapter explores the concept of conjunction or the mystical union of opposites. It discusses the alchemical marriage of spirit and matter, light and dark, and male and female energies. Instructions for creating talismans and amulets that harness these dualities are provided. The chapter also delves into the symbolic importance of certain materials and the proper timing of rituals according to celestial events. Opposites are joined in unity. Thus shall you invoke the ultimate power. Chapter 5. The Gate of Deceit. This chapter is a guide to the descent into the underworld, a metaphorical journey representing the confrontation of one's deepest fears and the mastery over infernal powers. It details the rites for summoning and commanding various demonic entities, emphasizing the need for courage and strength. The reader is warned about the dangers of this path and the necessity of maintaining strict control over the summoned entities. Descend to the underworld, the abode of demons. Boldness is required to open the fifth gate. Chapter 6, The Gate of Transformation. This chapter focuses on the theme of transformation, both of the self and of the physical world. It includes detailed instructions, performing alchemical transmutations, such as turning base metals into gold and creating the philosopher's stone. The text also discusses personal transformation, encouraging the reader to undergo a metaphorical death and rebirth to achieve spiritual enlightenment. Changed form, revealed truth, transmutation is the key to power. Chapter 7, The Gate of Power. This chapter teaches the reader how to harness and direct supernatural power, it covers protective spells, offensive magic, and rituals for gaining influence over others. The text emphasizes the importance of ethical considerations and the dangers of abusing power. The reader is instructed to perform various exercises to strengthen their will and control over magical forces. Power rules, turn knowledge into command. Chapter 8, The Gate of Revelation. The penultimate chapter reveals deeper cosmic truths and the hidden structures of the universe, discusses the nature of reality, the interconnectedness of all things, and the existence of higher planes of consciousness. The reader is guided through advanced meditative practices and rituals designed to enhance spiritual awareness and connectivity with the divine. Revelation is the light of truth. Chapter 9, Gate of the Shadow. The final chapter is the most enigmatic and dangerous. It is said to contain the method to summon the ultimate infernal entity and gain its favor. The text is written in a highly cryptic manner, requiring the reader to use the knowledge gained from the previous chapters to decode it. The rituals described are perilous and require exact precision. This chapter serves as the culmination of the reader's journey, offering immense power, 
but also the greatest risk. In darkness lies the ultimate light. The ninth gate opens the kingdom of shadows. Aristoria Toria was tried and executed for heresy and witchcraft by the Roman Catholic Inquisition. Legend has it, on the night before his execution, Toria claimed to have hidden the true secret of the nine gates within the book, which could only be revealed to those with the knowledge and insight to decode its mysteries. Following his execution, most copies of the book were confiscated and destroyed by the church, but a few are believed to have survived, hidden away in private private collections and secret libraries. Today, only three copies of the nine gates of the Kingdom of Shadows are known to exist. 1. The Vatican Secret Archives The Church maintains a copy for study and containment, wary of its potential power. 2. The National Library of France This copy was acquired during the French Revolution and has been kept under strict, strict security ever since. 3. Private Collection The third copy is owned by an anonymous collector, rumored to belong to a wealthy European aristocrat. The deep interest in the occult Each of these copies is subtly different, with minor variations in the engravings and texts, suggesting that the true secrets of the Nine Gates can be unlocked only by comparing all three. In modern times, the Nine Gates has become a subject of fascination, not just for historians and occultists, but also for conspiracy theorists and enthusiasts of the supernatural. Numerous attempts have been made to translate and decode the book, but its true meaning still needs to be discovered. Some believe it to be a genuine grimoire with real power, while skeptics argue that it is merely a clever forgery or an elaborate hoax perpetrated by Toria or his contemporaries. Recall that the Bible truly claims that Enoch was carried up to heaven in Genesis. In reality, he never passed away. It's all about his trip into heaven, which is what I found to be the most fascinating book. The most recent iterations of the story are now written in this archaic form of English, so I translated it into a much more comprehensible version using ChatGPT. This is the modern English translation of the Book of Secrets. There there was a man by the name of Enoch, and it all began while he was sleeping. He was distressed and started crying for no apparent reason. These two men, bigger than any man on earth, emerged out of nowhere. They had radiant faces like the sun, wings more brilliant than gold, eyes blazing with brilliance. They stood to his bedside and greeted Enoch by name. The men comforted him, saying they were sent by the eternal God. That day, Enoch would also ascend to heaven with them. He was raised to the first heaven and placed on the clouds by the angels, who bore him on their wings. I looked up and noticed the ether. They put me in the first heaven and showed me a vast sea that surpassed all other seas on earth. They revealed to me the two hundred angels who oversee the stars and serve the skies, as well as the elders and chiefs of the heavenly hierarchies. They showed me the due treasure house, which looked like olive oil. These treasure homes were defended by numerous angels. Then those people seized me and brought me to the second heaven. They revealed to me a darkness deeper than any darkness on earth. I saw captives there, suspended and weeping non-stop at all hours. I asked the man sitting next to me. They responded, These are God's apostates who disobeyed God's commands and turned away with their prince, now confined in the fifth heaven. I was sorry for them. When they saw me, they said, Man of God, pray for us to the Lord. However, I answered, who am I, a mortal, to ask angels for help? For me, who will offer prayers? After that, the men carried me to the third heaven, where I saw produce of an unparalleled quality. The tree of life, an inexplicably pleasant and fragrant tree, stood in the center. It seemed like a golden vermilion fire, covering everything and bearing various fruits. Between corruptibility and incorruptibility is paradise. This place is ready for an eternal inheritance for the righteous who live blamelessly before the Lord and bear the consequences of their sins. Next, the soldiers took me to the northern side, where they showed me a horrible location with several forms of torture. It was always on fire, pitch black and devoid of light. There was fire all around, along with frost, ice, and angels brandishing vengeful weapons and torturing people severely. The men said that this location is ready for people who disobey God after they see this horror. This location is ready for those people as an eternal inheritance. The men then guided me to the fourth heaven, where the sun and moon's sequential motions and light beams were visible. I saw how they moved, compared the lights, and concluded that the sun has more light than the moon. 
It never sleeps, moving non-stop day and night. It is looked after by fifteen myriads of angels during the day and a thousand angels at night. I saw other solar components that were in the air, called shear and phoenixes. They accompany the sun, measuring 900 meters, and have angelic wings. I was then stationed in the fifth heaven after the men had brought me there. I saw thousands upon thousands of troops, called Grigori, who looked human but were enormously tall, larger than even the gigantic giants who once lived on earth. There was no service at all in the fifth heaven. Their faces withered, and their tongues were silent forever. Why do those beings appear to be so withered, so melancholic? And why do they maintain such perpetual silence, I asked the men who were with me. These are the Grigori who rebelled against the Lord of Light under the leadership of their prince, Satan. Some of them were trapped in the second heaven's deep darkness after they fell. Breaking their vows, three of them came down to earth, to Mount Hermon. When they saw the daughters of men, they were seduced by their beauty and married them, which led to the spread of terrible wickedness. God, in his wisdom, has imposed a harsh penalty on them, and they will have to punishment on the Lord's day of justice. And just like that, those men carried me up to the sixth heaven, where I saw seven bands of gorgeous, luminous angels. Their countenances gleamed brighter than the sun. They maintain the appropriate government of the world and control the heavenly orders. They give directives to oppose misconduct and commandments in response to it. These archangels you see are in charge of both heavenly and terrestrial existence. Praise be to the Lord, these angels sang pleasantly and resoundingly. Their singing is too good to put into words. I was then taken to the seventh heaven by those two men, and I saw an incredibly bright light there. There were dominions, orders, governments and archangels along with physical forces. There were many-eyed creatures, cherubim, seraphim, and thrones, organizing into nine units referred to as the United Stations of Light. I shuddered when I saw this. The men comforted me, saying, Enoch, have courage, have no fear. Then they revealed to me the Lord sitting on his incredibly tall throne in the distance. Depending on their rank, all of the celestial soldiers would gather and stand on these ten steps. Then, in this infinite light, they would sing songs as they returned to their positions, bowing down to the Lord. They praised the Lord in whispers, saying, Holy, holy, the heavens and earth are full of your glory. The man with me stated, Enoch, this is as far as we can go with you, as I saw these angelic scenes. After that, they departed, and I didn't see them once more. When I was by myself at the end of the seventh heaven, terror took hold of me and I collapsed. Then, to console me, the Lord sent the lovely archangel Gabriel. Have courage, Enoch, he added. Have no fear. Accompany me, please. My Lord, my soul has left me due to terror and trembling, I replied to myself, troubled. However, Gabriel quickly raised me up like a leaf caught in the wind and brought me directly in front of the face of the Lord. There I saw the eighth heaven, called Muoth in Hebrew, which is in charge of the twelve constellations, dryness, and changing seasons. I caught sight of the ninth heaven, known in Hebrew as Kushim, beyond. The twelve constellations reside in this cosmic domain. I saw the Lord's visage appear on Aravo, the tenth heaven. In the book of Enoch, how did two hundred angels fall to hell? In today's video, we will explore the stories of Lucifer's rebellion and fall. Nephilim giants and other fascinating tales that have yet to be uncovered in Book 2 of Enoch. Let's dive in. Things changed long ago when 200 angelic beings descended upon Mount Hermon. A Godhead trio, comprised of God the Father, God the Word, and God the Spirit existed once. Although it seems contradictory, they existed before time, during time, and after time. Our perception is limited to our realm, they are not part of our reality. The angelic realm was an infinite realm that God established before the creation of humanity. A third rebelled under Lucifer's leadership and were expelled from the third heaven. The primary idea behind Lucifer's ultimate objective was to usurp the Father's throne and place it above his own. After creating mankind, he became the world's ruler after tricking Eve and Adam into the garden. As a result of Adam and Eve's disobedience, the Word of God cursed them. Lucifer set out to taint God's lineage in an effort to evade God's curse. Seth, 
another son of Adam was carried on God's bloodline after Cain killed Abel. But Lucifer thought of another scheme and sent two hundred of his fallen angels to Mount Hermon, a location on earth, to begin the second part of his evil scheme. His ultimate objective was to thwart the fulfillment of God's promise, which called for the creation of a human savior. I'm going to sow discord between you and the lady, as well as between your seed and her seed. It is going to bruise your head, and you are going to bruise his heel. When he died on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ caused the serpent's head to bruise. The prince of this world is judged now, he declared. The prince of this world has now been banished. Christ may have given Satan a head bruise. Specifically, the devil will be thrown into the fire-burning lake at the end of Christ's millennial rule, which will result in the literal bruising of the serpent's head at the end of the tribulation. Arriving on Mount Hermon, the two hundred fallen angels seek to corrupt the pure bloodline. Their main deed was to live among human women and breed a race that would taint the Savior's lineage. Many historians, scientists, and archaeologists have uncovered amazing technological and mechanical achievements from antiquity that surpass our current understanding over time. Unique light bulb generators that appear to illuminate Egyptian structures devoid of flames or reflected light can be discovered in Egyptian artifacts and pictograms. High-tech surgical kits with obsidian scalpels, which are composed of metals superior to our own and are used for cataract, knee, brain, and heart surgery were discovered in the suitcases of Peruvian witch doctors. Numerous more advanced forms of technology and metal components have been found and preserved in the waters. Among these enigmatic discoveries is a Greek Olympian dial, a relic that has been called the first computer and has the intricacy of a Swiss clock from the 19th century. Not to mention the historical significance of Stonehenge, the Giza pyramids, and the like. Actually, numerous finds show that our old civilization was highly developed at one point. Biblical writings also mention the Nephilim giants, who are thought to have assisted humanity in their technological and mechanical achievements. A number of fallen angels are described in the Book of Enoch as having rebelled against God descended to earth and imparted to humanity such old wisdom. And there were 200 fallen angels in total, they plummeted from Mount Hermon's pinnacle during Jared's days. Along with them, all the other men selected women, each choosing one for himself, and they entered the house and defiled themselves. And they introduced them to plants, told them about charms and enchantments, and demonstrated how to cut roots. They got pregnant and gave birth to enormous giants that ate up all of mankind's possessions. These giants were 3,000 feet in height. And the giants turned on them and ate humanity when men could no longer support them. And Azazel taught men how to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, and other weapons. He also taught them about earthly metals and how to work with them as well as how to make bracelets, ornaments, antimony, eyelid beautifying, expensive stones of all kinds, and all colored tinctures. And a great deal of godlessness developed, along with immorality and being missled, and turned corrupt in every manner. Samjaza imparted knowledge on charms and root cuttings, while Armaros taught the technique of dispelling charms, Barakajul taught astrology, Kokabel the constellations, Ezekiel the cloud knowledge, Arachiel the earth signs, Shamsiel the sun signs, and Sariel the moon path. Enoch 6. This book claims that 200 fallen angels fell to the summit of Mount Hermon from the heavenly realm. There, they were enthralled by the beauty of human women to the point where they assumed human form and engaged in sexual relations with them. A race of half-angelic, half-human creatures emerged throughout the land as a result of this sin. Genesis 6-4. There is a race called Nephilim Giants. Their wives and children learned a variety of new technological talents from their parents, the fallen angels, such as how to make swords, work with metal, cast spells, and more. Using that knowledge, the Nephilim constructed megastructures, cities, machines, and other things. Many people today find it perplexing. We can thus presume that the Nephilim giants possessed their workmanship in antiquated technology and machinery if we consider what the Book of Enoch indicates about how they obtained this knowledge. We might also presume that many of the technological achievements we are seeing now are probably the result of the work of these Nephilim beings. Whatever your point of view, humankind has made enormous strides in the last 150 years. Computers, phones, TVs, circuit boards, radios, vehicles, satellites, microchips, lasers, nuclear weapons, and millions more technological innovations were produced during this period. Things like force fields, teleportation, hover cars, and similar technologies could all be possible in the near future. The majority of people on Earth have had their lives affected by technological explosions. 
and these are no trivial achievements. However, have you ever taken a moment to sit and consider how these inventions came about so quickly? We have seen tremendous technological developments in the last 150 years that have never been seen before. Why is the quickest means of transportation for 5,000 people were horses, ships, and even on foot yet today we have devices like scooters and cars, and we can even go to the moon and back? Why is there a technological gap? According to my theory, Nephilim and fallen angels have assisted in the development of these technical advancements. These evil entities have access to knowledge that could lead to some of the advancements we witness in the modern era. You may be asking yourself, if Nephilim has existed since the creation of man, why haven't we seen any advancements in the last 150 years? Excellent query. The Bible claims that during Noah's deluge in the year 3000 BC, some of the fallen watcher angels, who were the parents of the Nephilim, were bound in chains and sent to hell. And he has kept in mind the angels who left their own home and did not remain in their own position of power. He has been imprisoned in black eternal chains until the great day of judgment. Joel 1-6 Because even the angels who sinned were not spared by God. They are being held captive in the dark, dreary depths of hell until the day of judgment because of what he did to them. 2 14 2 Peter the really interesting part is that the book of Enoch states that these fallen angels were supposed to be released anew after 70 generations. Hold them fallen angels fast in the earth's valleys for 70 generations, until the day of their judgment and fulfillment, until the judgment that lasts forever and ever is fulfilled. 10 Enoch 12 Given that God bound the watcher angels in 3000 BC, they, according to the book of Enoch, are scheduled for liberation after 70 generations. If my calculations are accurate, we would be in the 1900s or 20th century, based on 70 generations x 70 years, or 70 years for each generation. At this very moment, the explosion of information, weapons, global conflicts, technology, and immorality started to occur. In addition, Daniel 12-4 in the book of Daniel predicts a surge in knowledge in the last days. Is this because watcher angels are disseminating their knowledge to the general public? In particular, given that it has been 5,000 years since their last discharge, which occurred around 3000 BC. Consider this, for 5,000 years, there were only modest technological advancements. Humans only had access to walking, horses, carriages, and boats for transportation. We have been entering a new era of vehicles, aircraft, and rocketry since the 1900s, and in a little over 150 years, we will even be visiting the moon. It looks like they have been released from my perspective. Finally, you might be wondering if fallen angels existed on Earth during the technological lag. Yes, that is the response. Other fallen angels do exist because when Satan was expelled from heaven, he took some angels with him. This is probably more than the 200 mentioned in the book of Enoch, even though it wasn't the group of 200 fallen angels that were bound by God for sharing knowledge and having sex with humans. It's also possible that the other fallen angels on Earth chose not to provide information out of concern about suffering a penalty akin to that meted out to the 200 as a result of God's retribution. However, since we are in the latter days, God has freed the original 200 angels and taken off his cloak of protection. It's important to keep in mind that devils exist on Earth. Fallen angels are not the same as them. The Bible makes a distinction between them, and we need to too. They are also present on Earth, corrupting the masses. The next video talks about the prison of the fallen angels in book 2 of Enoch. Watch the video now.